looking at is the Moog Apollo Synthesizer. The Moog Apollo Synthesizer has quite a confusing history, but I'm going to try and lay it out for you. Okay, in around 1973-74, Moog had a system in mind that would include a monophonic synthesizer, a polyphonic synthesizer, and a monophonic foot pedal bass synthesizer. Kind of a whole package in one package. This uh, set was to be called the Constellation. Now the Constellation included the Lyra Mono Synth, the Apollo Polyphonic Synthesizer, and the Taurus Bass Foot Pedals. The prototype Apollo that they came up with for that system, I believe there was more than one. One of them was lent to Keith Emerson to use in his setup, and you can see him playing both the Apollo and the Lyra in a number of pictures. It was apparently a relatively limited polyphonic synthesizer, but everyone was screaming for polyphonic synthesizers, so it was very exciting. Somewhere between 74 and 75, the Constellation series, that set, was dropped, and the name of their polyphonic synthesizer was changed from the Apollo to the Polymoog, and it was released in 1975 called the Polymoog Keyboard, and it had a number of 203A. They decided to make a more budget sort of polymode that was stripped down in features, but uh, featured primarily the presets, the same functionality that you're looking at right here. Now that synthesizer was released in 1978 and it was called the Polymode Keyboard. But wait, you might say, what about the previous Polymode Keyboard? Well, they changed the name of the previous Polymode Keyboard, the full featured synthesizer, to the Polymode Synthesizer and called the pared down feature version, the keyboard. So in 1978, the Polymoog keyboard became the Polymoog synthesizer and the Polymoog keyboard, which was a new synthesizer keyboard came out. There, it's that simple. Now you may ask, um, <laughs> so what, what is this Moog Apollo? There aren't many of these kicking around. I know of two in existence. Um, I don't know if there may be actually more. This Moog Apollo is sort of like an early version of the 1978 Polymoog keyboard. And it has the same model number, 280A, as the Polymoog keyboard that came out in 1978. So this was an early release version. Here's <laughs> the adapted timeline. First, there was the Apollo. The Apollo was turned into the Polymoog keyboard in 1975 and released. And then in 1978, the pared down version of the Polymoog, it seems, was to be called the Apollo. But at some point, they changed the pared down version of the Polymoog from the name Apollo Synthesizer to Polymoog Keyboard, which is the same name as the previous Polymoog Keyboard. So they changed that model's name to the Polymoog Synthesizer. There, it's easy, right? Okay, not so much. But anyhow, this is one of maybe two in existence. I'm gonna show you how it works and let you listen to how it sounds. So this, the Moog Apollo synthesizer, shares a lot of functionality and structure with the other Polymoog synthesizers. I'm not so sure about the original Apollo. But certainly, uh, it shares that lineage. It is a divide-down synthesizer, which is a structure where 12 oscillators' frequencies are divided in half over and over again to create frequencies for each of the keys. And uh, this is a much maligned sort of synthesizer setup because it either becomes extremely expensive or extremely limited. And here's how. Usually, all of those notes need to have for us to be really happy, all of them need individual filter articulation and amp articulation. If you take all of those notes and put it through one filter and one amp, you'll get restarts, re-triggering every time you play multiple notes while you're holding down notes. And that is not a pleasing outcome for most synthesizer players. So that's kind of, kind of been the problem with divide down synthesizers is that you have that limitation. In the case of the Polymoog, they created a chip called the Polycom chip, which has a little synthesizer 
in for each of the keys. So each of the keys has its own very, very simple VCA and VCF articulation. When you press a note and hold it, you can press another note and it sounds like a new note. It doesn't need to go through the same filter and amp. So that's how this synthesizer is set up. It also has a filter that can be used, a single filter that all the voices can be put through. As you'll see when we listen to the voice that is brass, re-triggering happens when anytime you're holding notes and you press a new note, all of the notes re-trigger. That's indicating that all of those keys are going through a single filter. So there's a single filter in there as well. So the filter that exists in there is preset and we don't really have access to that from the keyboard. And that is kind of a limitation, but it creates a very nice brass noise, which you'll hear if you haven't heard already. Um, we have limited control over a number of factors like modulation and attack and the balance of three different sections of the keyboard but we don't have a lot of synthesizer control so basically this is a fully preset synthesizer and it sounds better than some synthesizers where they don't have the polycom chip or a similar chip and um, you, in many synthesizers that are divided down there's only one filter and one amp so all of the voices have to go through that but in this one you can get some really wonderful sounds that because they each note has individual articulation also, it is velocity sensitive. Um, how hard you play affects how loud the notes are, which is not a really common feature from the 1970s. Analog synths from the 1970s, not a lot of them comparatively have the ability to be velocity sensitive. So this made this a really great performance device. And uh, basically you bought this if you just wanted to play these 14 presets, which is more presets than existed in the original Polymo keyboard that became known as the synthesizer. <laughs> it never gets any simpler. I want to demonstrate the ladder filter that exists on the Moog Apollo. And this sounds great, right? That's because it is great. All of these voices are being directed through a single filter. And if you play right, you'll never notice it. No problem, right? Well, here's where the problem starts. What happens if I'm playing this? I'm holding the chord with my right hand and I'm playing with my left hand, What you're hearing is the envelope going to the filter being re-triggered with each note I play. So that just means that when you're playing, you're not going to get a lot of the ability to hold notes and play other notes. Uh, when you're using the preset voices that contain the envelope controlling the single filter. And that's not all of them. In fact, it's only really the brass ones. But that sound is so great, it's worth the trouble. You can also do some really cool things like play, um, rapidly play chords without having to play your entire hand. So you can kind of manipulate that, and that's a cool thing. The Polymoog is much maligned for that functionality, but it has such a great sound. I'm not entirely sure why people are so frustrated with it. And also there are so many sounds that don't evince that limitation. Over here in the corner, we have the fine tune and beat. The fine tune, which is the outer knob, basically allows you to tune this synthesizer. In addition to this, we also have the beat, which on certain presets allows two layers of oscillators to vary in pitch enough to create pleasing beating, or basically what we've come to call detune. You can get it pretty wild there. And you have this helpful LED to tell you how close or how far you are. The more it's blinking, the further you are away. So the more detuning you have, the more chorusy and pleasing the sound becomes. We 
We also have the volume, uh, which probably doesn't need a whole lot of explanation. The octave balance seems like a fancy name, but really what it means is this synthesizer's keyboard is divided into three sections, and you can control the volume of those sections. And it becomes helpful when you're using the bass function so that you can control how loud the rest of the synthesizer is to the bass. But even if you're not using the bass, you can decide how loud each section is depending on each sound, because in some sounds the bass is relatively quiet and the high end is relatively shrill. This next section, the bass filter, is sort of misleadingly labeled, <laughs> because looking at it you think, oh, there's a filter on the bass section. But actually it's a full-on bass that you can filter and you can control how much the bass plays a role in the sound you're using. Okay, so I have it set to the simple string sound. This setting has it set to the preset sound, which is currently strings. But when you turn this on, it activates the bass and the lower two octaves become the bass. We don't hear it because the level is at zero. So that's the bass sound. And so if you want a Ray Manzarek it, not that that's anything like Ray Manzarek, but basically if you want to play bass, no pun, with your left hand while you're playing a voice with the other, that's what this is for. And you get to decide the quality of the bass using the filter. So that's cool. Basically, God, I gotta stop saying that. It allows you to, to affect the timbre of the bass, but like I just did, you can also kind of have a little bit of fun with it because it sounds like there's a little bit of resonance in it. But yeah, so you have the option of layering a bass into this synthesizer while you're playing other presets. Modulation section is also pretty cool. It allows you to vary the sound over time. Here, listen, let's listen to what it does on the string section. Um, I've already pressed the variation button. So you can hear that there's pitch modulation happening. And you can control the frequency of that variation. And in some presets, that all, this also allows you to affect, clearly hear the effect of the beating function. And then if you add that together with the modulation. Now attack, we're gonna try it out with preset 11. I'm gonna press the variation button. Attack at zero, we get a fair amount of punchy attack. But as we increase the attack, it takes longer for the volume of the sound to reach its maximum level. So when you want to have slow attack, usually for something more expressive or something slower, um, you can use the slow attack. This doesn't necessarily work with all of the sounds, but uh, it can lend a sort of more expressive affect to the sound that you're playing if it, in fact, affects that sound. Okay, so this part probably doesn't need a demonstration, but it's so fun I can't help myself. It is the pitch controller. The pitch controller is a blast. It's just like the pitch controller that was in the 1975 Micromoog, it's a metal screen strip that feels actually really nice on your fingers. And it allows you to, to a degree, control the pitch. And that's a lot of fun if you're in the middle of playing and you wanna do. And you can have a lot of fun with it. Um, yeah. 
I could sit here and demonstrate this over and over again, but we'd all know that really what I'm doing is just having fun with the pitch ribbon. Mm-hmm.